Okay, I think it's uh, time to start the ne next uh, session. Uh, if you can um, have your seats, and we'll start in seconds. All right, so the next session is uh, um, uh, titled uh, Payload Enhancement. And uh, uh, this session brings together three experts uh, who will share their research experience and thoughts on space exploration and sustainability. Uh, we have Chris Moore, astrophysicist uh, from the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. And then we have uh, Judith Sumner, ethnobotanist and author, and Anne Reicho, head of uh, data science at uh, FUNGA. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Chris Moore. Uh, he is, uh, Astrophysicist who is uh, intrigued with how stars work. Uh, Dr. Moore focuses on constraining solar atmospheric heating mechanisms uh, during all phases of the solar cycle. Uh, uh, he's also develops new technology and instrumentation to acquire better data on astrophysical phenomena. So let's welcome Dr. Moore. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? It's good? OK, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all today. I noticed this is about Mars and exploration of Mars. So this is slightly off topic. But I'm talking about the sun today, the closest star to us and actually has the, some of the biggest impacts in the environment around Mars. And because this is mostly about Mars, I'm just focusing on the basics of the sun and solar activity. So if you have questions, if you want me to get into more detail, just let me know. So one thing that I can say about this talk today, that it will be very different. We'll be focusing on different aspects of the sun. Right here, you're seeing actual satellite observations. <clears throat> they're kind of low resolution. I'll have some higher res resolution videos in a second. But there are multiple wavelengths, and it's showing the dynamic nature of the sun and how variable, just spatially, if we look in the ultraviolet, how the sun appears. So these are taken by basically space weather satellites, the geostationary operational environmental satellites, GOES for short. And with this, we can see that there's things that happen on various time scales and different spatial scales. The primarily eruptions. You can actually see coronal mass ejections be jettisoned off into space. And I'll discuss those a little bit more in the next few slides. But as I said before, everything is different in terms of solar variability. I'll be highlighting how the sun varies on seconds to yearly timescales. So just to make sure everyone's on the same page, I noticed that there are a lot of scientists and engineers here, but just to make sure that the nomenclature, um, we're all consistent with the nomenclature, I'm focusing on soft x-rays to the right, which are orders of magnitude more energetic than optical light, which is how we see each other right now. We're most familiar and common with radio waves in terms of electromagnetic radiation. This is in our cars, microwaves are in our houses, in our kitchens, infrared is what our bodies readily emit. Our ultraviolet comes from the sun, and if the solar atmos Earth's atmosphere didn't absorb most of it, we would get skin cancer on a regular basis, so that's not good. Um, gamma rays, we don't want to be around those. <laughs> those will probably kill you very fast. And so the astronauts that would go to Mars, they would care a lot about gamma rays, X-rays, and ultraviolet radiation, which can vary on very, very short time scales from the sun. Now, there are very many different types of stars. For my research in general, before I started to study the sun, I was really interested in the stars that are the biggest and brightest, the hot blue stars on the top left of this diagram. The stars come in all shapes and sizes, different masses, different um, intensities of their radiation, different phases of their evolution. The sun is a basic moderate middle-aged star. It's about four and a half billion years old. Even though it is a middle-aged average type of star, it still has a lot of dynamics with it, and you saw that earlier. I personally think that the sun is one of the coolest stars, and I'll show you reasons why, that I believe that's true. So we're mostly common with visible light, if we were to take a telescope and point at the sun, which we have here, the Solar Dynamics Observatory Atmospheric Imaging Assembly, this is 450 nanometers of visible light. It looks pretty mundane. But what you do notice is that here, can you all see my cursor? 
Yes. That there is a dark spot. Uh, these are called sunspots. They are strong concentrations of magnetic field piercing through the solar photosphere, the sphere of light. Now these sunspots are about the size of Earth. Earth is here on the bottom left scale. And it takes about a 100 Earths to go across the diameter of the sun. So the sun is fairly, very large as we know. <clears throat> and one of the reasons that we have these sunspots and some of this variability is driven by the magnetic nature of the sun. It's a big ball of plasma. You get plasma moving, charged current moving, it generates magnetic fields. Magnetic fields feed back on the plasma, et cetera, et cetera. It becomes highly nonlinear, fairly complex. A more simplistic nature of visualizing the magnetic field structure is Earth, actually, where we have iron, liquid iron in the core, and that makes these bar magnet like magnetic features, which are fairly simplistic. Where the geographic North Pole is the geomagnetic South Pole for Earth. On the Sun, it's very complex, it's much more different. Now, there is a large scale dipolar magnetic um, magnet feature like for the Sun at very large spatial scales, but once you get closer to the sun and as a function of its evolutionary cycle, these magnetic fields can twist and entangle. They can lead to disruptive, eruptive events that accelerate plasma, create waves, heat up the plasma, and make light on various time scales. So magnetic field for Earth, relatively speaking, fairly simple. Magnetic field for stars, in this case the sun, highly complex. This complexity, again, manifests itself in visible features in the photosphere of sunspots. We know this from direct inferred magnetic field strength along the line of sight. So the magnitude and direction where white is out of the plane, out of the board, looking at you, and black is into the board. Uh, this, these sunspots um, are where the strongest field are. Now, we notice that it's grayscale here. Now, that is, the fact that it's gray doesn't mean there is no magnetic field present. It's just the, the magnitude is much smaller in terms of into and out of the board compared to the white and black spots. Now, as we look at different wavelengths of light, in this case, x-rays in the image to the farthest on the, farthest on the right, we notice the sun looks very different. These sunspots are co-spatial with what we call active regions. The x-rays probe the hottest plasma above a million Kelvin, while the photosphere is about five to 6,000 Kelvin. This is called the coronal heating situation, a scenario. This does not happen with all stars, but the sun is a unique star where the magnetic field nature drives this temperature inversion as you move radially away from the surface, the temperature tends to go up. And that leads to confinement of plasma from the magnetic field that's intertwined. So again, this is not large scale bipolar, it's actually these bipolar complex looping magnetic fields on a small, smaller spatial scale and then it makes light in x-rays. These active regions vary over time. And as individual active region could live for a few months, live for a few months until it diffuses away. But the collection of active regions, like how many we see on average on the solar disk, varies over time. Roughly an 11 year cycle going from min to max to min again. What we have here are images from the Hinode X-ray telescope, which takes very high spatial images of the sun in x-rays. And we see from this time here, there aren't many active regions or sunspots. As we move towards the right, we go about six years to 2014. And you see they're plentiful, seven or eight easily that I can identify with my eyes. And this repeats itself over and over and over. And this is linked again to the increasing magnetic activity. Now again, why do we call them active regions? Because giant eruptions and instabilities take place. Here is an example of extreme ultraviolet imagery from the, again, SDO, but a different instrument, the Atmospheric Imaging Assembly. We're looking at ultraviolet light. The coolest plasma, about 50,000 Kelvin, is the black, reddish plasma that you see here. About a million Kelvin is the white. And there is hotter plasma, about two to three mega Kelvin. That's the purplish color. Now, <clears throat> this is not a movie, like a fake movie. This is, these are actual observations from telescopes in space pointing at the sun. Now, they have been highly processed, and this is sped up. So about a second here is about five minutes in real time. And one can watch the plasma follow the magnetic field features back down. So I think that's pretty cool. So this are some of the aspects that we study with our research group at the Center for Astrophysics. 
But this isn't about our research in our group per se. This is about you learning more about solar activity and how it can influence future exploration of Mars. So active regions, which you can see here, there are plentiful. Uh, this video is from Milosav Druckmuller. He makes many of these. And I encourage you to go to his website because there are many more and they're pretty cool. Now, as mentioned before, magnetic activity links to these instabilities and these eruptions. The, earlier this month, from the beginning of May until now, there have been about 40 or 50 moderate to large solar flares. I don't know if you, any of you guys saw over the past two weeks there were aurora that could be seen in Massachusetts. That came from these eruptions and the associated ejecta of coronal mass ejections that propagated to Earth, followed Earth's magnetic field, and then precipitated down and interacted with the particles in Earth's atmosphere, which then glue or glowed in visible light, purple, reddish colors. So what we're looking at here <clears throat> are videos from the past May 1st until now, so the past three weeks. And we can see where, again, the strongest magnetic field has these active regions. And every time you see these flashes, particles are being accelerated, plasma is heated, copious light, radiation is emitted. And this is an extreme ultraviolet in a particular filter. For astronauts, for others, they really want to know when is this happening. I mean, eight minutes is about the time it takes from light being radiated from the sun to, to get to Earth. So that's not a lot of time to make any adjustments. The coronal mass ejections, they can take anywhere from a few hours to a day or two. It depends on where on the solar disk the eruptions happen and how, the trajectory it follows to Earth. Solar energetic particles can be almost relativistic, so those can take tens of minutes to many hours to arrive. Those can be problematic for individuals, organisms, et cetera, that are in space going to Mars or on Mars. What's pretty important is the strength of Earth, Mars' magnetic field. As we know, Earth's magnetic field protects us. Mars' magnetic field is not as strong and, and far the extent out as Earth's is. Now, these coronal mass ejections, CMEs, what we're looking at are imagery from coronographs. So they basically occult the bright visible light disk. That's this white circle you see here. And for various radii, for two different fields of views, narrow and far, narrow on the left, far on the right, we can see, and these are almost cotemporal. So we can see eruptions happen in this narrow view, and then we see them, the same plasma ejecta, which is radiating in visible light in the wide field of view. <coughs> Only the eruptions that come almost directly or on an, a, a slight angle to the leading edge of the rotation of the sun are the ones that can go straight towards Earth and cause immense impact. Now, we care about where Mars is. So Mars isn't always where Earth is, so this satellite won't always help in terms of predicting when coronal mass ejections will go to Mars. So likely, we will need other observatories, other satellites orbiting Mars, similar to MAVEN. But before I, I briefly talk about MAVEN, I want to talk about more of the so different solar cycles. Like I mentioned, everything's different. So we had different types of eruptions, flares, solar energ energetic particles, coronal mass ejections. This fluctuation or this cycle over 11 years, we can see here from the daily sunspot number, going from 1983 on the left to 2012 on the right, as is a maximum, then a minimum. This corresponds to a inverse relationship with the detected cosmic rays from neutron experiments, or neutron measurements here on Earth. These are cosmic rays. Some of the cosmic rays come from the sun, right, from the solar eruptions themselves. But the majority of the ones plotted here are coming from outside of the solar system. This could be massive stars, like the bright stars I mentioned earlier, exploding and having ejecta, accelerating particles to uh, relativistic speeds, so towards the speed of light. They're highly energetic. They interact in Earth's atmosphere, and then the byproducts are measured here at Earth. So as the solar atmosphere magnetic field becomes more complex, it actually acts as a shield to deflect some of these cosmic rays, and so they don't actually make it to be detected. So there's an inverse relationship here. In the third plot here, we have the X-rays measured from the geos goes, essentially. And this correlates with the sunspot number, as you saw earlier. We have proton events. These are mostly linked to these solar flares, these eruptions. And they are fairly spiky because these are the few seconds to few minute time scales where these eruptions occur. In the bottom, we have magnetic field measurements from GOES from a magnetometer that orbits uh, sun's, uh, I think it's a stationary orbit around Earth. And we can see 
the vertical magnetic field orientation <clears throat> on the day and the night side. And these also have temporal fluctuations, which could be on seconds, depending on minutes, depending on solar storms. So when the CME comes towards Earth, it can push back the magnetic field of Earth, and it also can extend out the tail in the back end, and that's what some of these measurements indicate from goals. But again, like I said, this is all about Earth, essentially, and what the sun's doing and how it affects Earth. We want to get to Mars. This is one last visual just showing the density or the amount of sunspots and how it can vary for different 11-year solar cycles. This is basically solar latitude on the top plot. The zero is the equator. The magnetic fluxes are actually opposite polarity for leading and trailing edges. And when the, because of differential rotation, the sun or rotates faster at its equator than the poles, the plasma flows and converges towards the equator, where we have magnetic flux cancellation on the, on the small spatial scale. So you'll see these spots originate higher latitudes and migrate down over time. And eventually, the belief is that a lot of this flux cancels out and it kind of resets itself, the larger magnetic field structure of the sun. So, the sun's complex. It affects Earth in many ways. So how does it affect Mars? There is another satellite mission, and by far, I am not an expert on MAVEN. I just wanted to mention it here. I, I saw earlier that we had two experts on MAVEN, so they can speak much more about MAVEN. But MAVEN is designed to study the atmosphere and its evolution. And this slide is just to point out that there are a plethora of instruments that have been taking data since 2013, and we likely would need future observatories to do something similar and expand upon what's pre been previously done. I have just put a few YouTube videos here just for reference, and I'm willing to answer more questions specifically about the sun and its effect on Earth. Thank you. Thank you. This questions. is so wonderful. Uh, I'm curious, does this activity affect the distribution of wavelength? Because this would connect to the microbes and the different bacteria are sensitive to different light uh, wavelengths. So I'm curious if these effects are detectable at that level. So I would like to repeat the question, make sure I understand it. So you're asking are there different um, portions of the EM spectrum that are radiated from the sun? Is it vary over time? Yeah. So, yes. so X-rays, orders of magnitude, you're talking about a million to, um, so it depends on <laughs> It depends where. So the most energetic x-rays, 10 keV, 20 keV, it can vary by up to a million. You asked about microwaves, correct? Visible light. Visible light? Um, factor of 1,000 at most. But that's the power, the total radiative power for the sun is mostly invisible light. And the fluctuations, <laughs> let me be clear about that. It's really like a percent if that is fractions of a percent to a percent. The biggest event was close to like a percent. Now in x-rays, it can be orders of magnitude, like I mentioned before, even up to a million at the highest energies, where you have almost no flux and then you have abundance amount of flux. In the soft x-rays where we took most of our measurements is about a factor of a thousand. And that's from one to five KeV, where we conduct most of our science for our research group. Um, so there's radio burst, there are different types, type one, type two, et cetera. There are microwaves that can be emitted from the sun, from solar flares, primarily. And active regions themselves have a quasi-steady um, emission in radio, but the biggest impact are from the flares. No other questions? All right, so our next speaker is Dr. Judith Sumner. Uh, she's a botanist uh, uh, with lifelong interest in ethnobotany and plant uses. She is the author of books on medical plants, on medicinal plants, North American uh, ethnobotany, and botanical aspects of the Civil War and World War II. Uh, let's uh, welcome uh, Dr. Sumner. She is online, by the way. Can you hear us? 
yes, I can. Uh, right. Let's see here. Share screen. Okay, are we all set? Yes, go ahead. Okay, well, thank you for inviting me to speak. I am a botanist, and today I am going to talk about something extremely basic. How do humans on Mars eat? What is for dinner? And how do they cope with conditions out of nature? So, so we'll get started. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, could you go into presentation mode? Yes. How's that? Yes, excellent. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay. So, starting, we're going to talk a little bit about what plants actually need to live, because the idea would be to grow crops on Mars. So at their most basic level, plants need what we think of usually as fertilizer. And we'll talk more specifically about what some of those nutrients would be. Presumably those would originate with the regolith, which is the, uh, the gravel, the dust, and the grit that comprise uh, the Martian substrate. Uh, plants actually need gravity. We know that root, root growth is not normal without a gravitational force. And even the hardening substance called lignin, which impregnates woody tissue and food conducting, the water conducting tissue, does not develop correctly without gravitational force. Uh, we know that plants have an upper and a lower temperature in which they grow. That varies with the species. We know that plants cannot live without certain symbionts. Some plants have microbial symbionts. Some plants depend upon pollinators. Uh, as, as symbiotic organisms. We know that plants need carbon dioxide and oxygen. Uh, carbon dioxide is directly involved in the photosynthetic process. It is reduced by the water, which is the next requirement, which is actually split at the beginning of the light reactions of photosynthesis. It is the reduced carbon dioxide that actually makes the starch that plants make and store and share with us for food. Uh, oxygen is needed for uh, respiration. Uh, in all plant cells. All plant cells respire the same way that we do. And perhaps most importantly, plants need light. Uh, the light actually, uh, if we look at the photosynthetic spectrum of green plants, we see a uniform requirement for both red and blue light. Uh, the red peaks somewhere between 450 and 475 nanometers, and the blue peak is somewhere around 650 and uh, 675 nanometers. Um, characteristics of an ideal crop plant. If I were to sit down uh, with a with a pad of paper and try to design an ideal crop plant to grow on Mars, this is what I came up with. Uh, high food value, high nutrients per unit volume. Those new nutrients might be might be proteins, they might be vitamins, even possibly uh, carbohydrates. Uh, these plants would grow fast uh, and ideally would be able to grow hydroponically because going into a marsh environment, there would not be soil, not yet at least. Uh, most tissues made by these plants would be edible. So the plants would not be using up available resources to grow a lot of non-edible tissue. Most of what they grew could be eaten, uh, has seeds uh, that could be stored, uh, perhaps indefinitely at cold temperatures, uh, something that propagates easily, perhaps even from cuttings and not necessarily from seeds and something that does not require some exotic pollinator, something that is pollinated, either self-pollinated or, or easily pollinated with a, a camel hair brush or something that does not require some, some unique pollination mechanism. Uh, if you do a quick Google search for growing food on Mars, up come these artist renderings of different greenhouse designs. Uh, you, you can see an actual couple of actual uh, greenhouse designs at the bottom. The top two are fanciful uh, and 
at NASA, there are actually uh, microscale uh, experiments with greenhouse-like environments. Uh, this one, uh, the data came out uh, in mid-2019. It basically uh, consists of mustard greens, microgreens grown in uh, a plastic enclosed chamber. It has that funereal purpley glow because it is including both the red and blue wavelengths. You combine them, you get this sort of violet tinge illumination. Uh, the idea was to figure out how could you grow these greens most efficiently uh, using particular ratios of red and blue light in a Martian environment. Uh, the nutrients that plants need are fairly uniform. Uh, lower right, if you go to the store at this time of the year and you buy a bag of fertilizer, you're going to see that three number ratio. That's the NPK ratio. It's uh, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and potassium. Uh, there are some other nutrients that plants need as well. Uh, look under the second block there of macronutrients, calcium, magnesium, sulfur are needed. And then we get into the micronutrients that we know they need, including boron, chlorine, magnesium, iron, zinc. And then some micronutrients might be needed by some plants or perhaps not. Honestly, there are some of these we're not terribly sure if plants need them yet or not. Uh, these nutrients can be delivered typically in soil, uh, in an agricultural environment in, on Earth. Soil is the most typical, and that's where the micronutrients come from, is from the soil. Most fertilizers do not have to contain the micronutrients because they are just simply available in trace amounts in soil. But if we move an agricultural scenario to Mars, the micronutrients would have to be provided. Perhaps the regolith would contain them. Perhaps they would have to be dissolved in a solution. And hydroponics, I think, would probably be the way to start growing plants. And of course, there's nothing new about hydroponics. Uh, hydroponics can consist of just a nutrient solution pumped through trays with plants suspended in the tray, or the grit and gravel, the small rocks of the regolith with a nutrient solution uh, passed through them. The lower two images show you hydroponic U.S. Army farms during World War II. In case you think hydroponics is a recent development, uh, the U.S. Army actually established hydroponic farms in the South Pacific on Iwo Jima, Okinawa, and other South Pacific islands. It was the only way that Army personnel stationed on those islands and got fresh food during World War II, and they were incredibly productive. Now, talk a little bit about three crops that I think would be reasonable options for growing on Mars. Uh, first of all, microgreens. I think NASA is correct in pursuing basically mustards. These are brassicas, they're mustards. You can grow mixed cultures of basically cabbage, wild mustards, broccoli. Um, they can be grown hydroponically. There is nothing here that cannot be eaten. These little seeds sprout. The entire young plant is consumable. They grow fast. You have crops within a few days, and they are loaded with vitamins. However, the two big drawbacks is that they provide virtually no calories and you have to have a continual source of seeds. And so if you run out of seeds, you will not have microgreens. So seeds would have to be stocked and stored for perhaps a prolonged period of time and then used judiciously. And if seeds began to run out, some of the plants would have to be grown on to the point of maturity. They would have to be pollinated perhaps by hand and allowed them to set seed. Those seeds would have to be saved for the next crops of microgreens. Uh, the next crop I would propose would be potatoes. Uh, potatoes are high in carbohydrates and high in vitamins. In fact, uh, nutritionists uh, have, have acknowledged that a diet of potatoes and some sort of dairy food, even dried milk, uh, is a pretty complete diet, and you can live on that almost indefinitely. Uh, in addition, potatoes have the potential for fermentation. Uh, they can be fermented into alcohol. That alcohol can be further fermented into vinegar. 
And uh, if you're wondering uh, why I have a, an image there of a V-2 rocket right in the middle of the side, uh, the V-2 rockets, the vengeance rockets that were used uh, at the end of World War II by the Germans, um, Londoners, were actually fueled by alcohol fermented from potatoes. Uh, potatoes can be grown hydroponically. They do not require seeds to grow. Uh, potatoes are cut apart from a mature potato that is sprouting, and those individual so-called eyes can be planted or can be grown hydroponically in solution and will basically create a clone of the parent plant. Potatoes also can be used to make bioplastics. Uh, the downside of potatoes is that the stems, the shoots, the stems, the leaves are completely inedible. They're actually toxic. Uh, they might be good fodder for microbes. And uh, if we can picture the first compost piles on, on Mars, you know, we'll possibly toss all the inedible shoots of potatoes into those and start producing soil. Uh, because they are a clone, they tend to be disease prone. Uh, remember back to our American history classes, our European history classes, and the tremendous influx of starving people from Ireland in the 19th century who came to the U.S. And that is the that is really the hazard of monoculture, that the plants are, are there. And as soon as you have one microbe or one insect, one pest that can infect them, all of the plants are genetically the same and tend to fall prey to, to that pest or insect or microbe. And the third uh, possible crop that I will mention and would be soybeans. Uh, soybeans are originally Asian, but they have tremendous genetic diversity. There are numerous different uh, cultivars, cultivated varieties of them known, uh, some with remarkably high protein content, uh, nearly 50% protein content in the seeds. Uh, it's really the botanical equivalent of meat. They can be grown hydroponically. You don't have to worry about fertilizing them. They fertilize themselves. Uh, and if you look at the USPTO website and do a patent search for soybeans, you will find somewhere in excess of 285,000 different patents for non-food items that can be made from, from uh, soybeans, uh, everything from drugs to fire retardant, fire extinguishing foams, various resins, oils, rubbers, plastics, you name it. Uh, lower right, poster from World War II. Uh, guns, you say, from soybean. Uh, they were actually making gun stocks from a soybean-generated bioplastic by the end of the war. Uh, the big potential problem with soybeans is that they will not grow and produce all of these proteins without their microbial symbiont, which is a rhizobium, rhizobium bacteria. And so the habitat has to also accommodate the rhizobium. And rhizobium uh, will not tolerate alkaline environments. And so that is something that would have to be monitored, that if there were minerals in the regolith that were uh, then releasing alkalinity uh, and turning uh, that solution basic, uh, that might inhibit the growth of rhizobium with soybeans. Uh, monoculture versus polyculture. Well, uh, you know, this is the big question in agriculture. Do we grow fields of a, a single crop? Do we grow fields in which we, we in, interplant and uh, intercropping is what we call polyculture, in which we have a variety of different crops growing in a single field. Uh, small scale intercropping works well. Big agriculture tends toward monocropping because of issues with harvesting. But there have been some experiments done on growing, for instance, carrots, peas, and tomatoes together with an eye toward what these might look like in a Martian colonial environment. There was one study published just a few weeks ago in PLOS1. Uh, and the data seems to suggest that if you plant peas, which are legumes like soybeans, so they have rhizobium, the rhizobium actually lives inside nodules, that you actually get more of these nodules forming if the plants are grown around other species. So carrots in the environment, tomatoes in the environment, the peas actually seem to make more nodules and culture more of this rhizobium symbiont. Uh, you tend to get higher nutrient levels in some of the crops. 
and very likely if pests were introduced to the environment, you would have fewer pests in a polyculture environment with intercropping than you would with a monoculture. Uh, the official position of NASA is that they will try not to introduce any pests to the Martian environment uh, with crop plants. Uh, I will tell you as a botanist, the likelihood of this is about zero. Uh, everything is everywhere. Microbes are by definition microscopic. It's virtually impossible to introduce seeds or plant materials without carrying microbes with them. And uh, it is almost invariable that there will be pests showing up in the Martian environment on food plants. And uh, I think the model I would, we would suggest would be the uh, integrated pest management model on Earth. Disease and pests are inevitable, but sanitation, monitoring, going out there and literally trapping or picking the bugs off the plants, discarding any diseased plants, introducing insects that eat pest insects, so the praying mantis, the ladybug, and then biological insecticides that do not poison people but poison bugs. Those based on products from the neem tree from India, pyrethrum from certain daisies, and essential oils largely from members of the mint family. And in closing, I want to say a little bit about how will people cope on Mars without being in nature? An integral part of nature is plant life. And humans have evolved in habitats that are really defined by plants. Uh, we think of this biophilia hypothesis as the innate desire of humans to connect with nature. And those nature or natural environments are really defined by plants, habitats, and the animals that live in them and the landscapes that really are the sum total of all of these plants living together. Uh, the late entomologist E.O. Wilson defined biophilia as the connections that human beings subconsciously seek with the rest of life. This might be missing in a Martian environment. And so what does that mean? What does it actually mean for the well-being of people? Well, I wish I knew. I wish I knew the answer to this. Uh, what is the long-term uh, effect of, uh, of having people outside of, of the natural environment? Uh, can humans, in fact, survive without nature? And is this an experiment we want to undertake? And I wonder if uh, we'll end up with self-selection over time, where people who volunteer to become colonists in space will be those who are perhaps predetermined to have no desire for life in nature. And what will the implications of this be? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm simply uh, just raising these questions with a little bit of concern. Uh, we look at the topic uh, historically, and since the turn of the last century, since social reform movements got started at the turn of the last century from 1900, 1890s to about 1920, it was always believed that plants improve quality of life and that particularly for children, exposure to plants and gardening helped to set these children uh, on the right course toward a productive life and a decent future. And uh, this was the origin of the fresh air camps and much of the kindergarten curriculum and the nature study movement at Cornell University and the school garden movement that really got its footing during World War I with victory gardens at schools, and then during World War II really became a thing uh, because there was a quite a bit of concern that boys, especially adolescent boys, would go off the rails if they didn't have some productive work to do, and there was nothing better than, than interacting with nature and gardening and uh, plant crops and all this sort of thing. Uh, we do know that nature deficit disorder which is what happens when kids are out of nature and have no contact with the real world, uh, does have documented physical and mental symptoms, including uh, depression and social disengagement. So um, just a few of these historical images here, School Gardens, Handbook of Nature Study from Cornell University, uh, and the last big piece on this published a few years ago, Richard Lube's book, 
last child in the woods arguing uh, for the exposure of children. And, uh, you know, I think we would apply this to adult populations as well if we end up with uh, colonial populations living on Mars. Uh, so uh, what to do about this? Well, certainly I think we can learn from biophilic design. Uh, this is something that's being done on Earth. How do we actually bring plant life uh, into office buildings so that people can enjoy being around plants and and have the feeling of nature even though they are in perhaps a work environment for most of their waking hours during the work week. And certainly the long-term goal is to produce soil so that even if plants have to be in greenhouses, uh, they, they can grow large and have more than just crop plants and have natural environments, even though they may be glass encased or encased in, in some sort of biopolymer, um, that would be the way to go. And so uh, when I was asked, what, what would you bring with you to Mars? I said, I would bring a, an inoculant for compost piles because anything that is grown that is not edible could be composted. And that would be the organic component to add to regolith to make soil so you really could grow some full-size plants. And for the first, colonists, I would hope that everybody would be involved in agriculture, that this would not just be a specialist job. I think it might do people good to spend a portion of every day around green plants and use those to enrich uh, the workday life uh, in a Martian environment. And uh, all of this, you know, I think back to Edison. I haven't failed. I have just found 10,000 ways that won't work. All of this requires experimentation. What will grow? What will not grow? What symbionts do they need to grow? What can we do to change the environment, to enhance plant growth? And then thousands of different cultivars to experiment with. And so the number of possible experiments that could come out of this are absolutely vast. Uh, since I have a captive audience, I will mention my last two books that focus on the connection between plant life and military history. Connect me with me on my webpage. And these two books are a history, a botanical history of World War II, and then a botanical history of the American Civil War. And if there are any questions, I would be glad to answer them. So I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that soybeans are self-fertilizing, right? But how about self-pollination? Uh, are any of these plants uh, you know, better in self-pollination than the others, or will we have to rely on insects for, for that? Well, uh, the plants that I mentioned today, um, well, potatoes are propagated um, clonally. And so, no, they would not have to be pollinated. Uh, soybeans self-pollinate and microgreens, if they were the goal of producing seeds so that the colony was really self-sustaining, those would have to be pollinated. And in nature, those are bee pollinated. So maybe, maybe bees, or they can be hand pollinated by patient humans with a small camel hair brush who simply take the pollen and move it from the stamen to the stigma on another flower. But certainly pollination is a, a limiting factor. And um, we have to keep it in mind. It's just that simple. <laughs> right, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Hi, you mentioned that gravity was key for the development of a lot of these things. Mars has gravity, but it's about a third of Earth's. Uh, will mm -hmm. that be adequate for these plants to form, or will we have to have induced some kind of artificial gravity through centrifugal force in order for these plants to develop properly? I think for herbaceous plants, there is enough gravity. 
I think maybe for a tree, there is not. Because a tree is very much dependent, the wood in a tree is very much dependent upon lignin formation. And apparently lignin formation, lignin synthesis, and the deposition of lignin in plant cell walls requires gravity, at least what we know on Earth. So I mean, when I say there are variables, I mean it. There really are variables here. Uh, I would, I mean, I, I am assuming that nobody would propose trying to grow some big woody plant like apple trees and harvest apples on Mars, not for a real long time. Uh, I think, I think herbaceous crops where there's, you know, comparatively little woody tissue would probably be fine. Uh, certainly hydroponics should be okay because the, the roots are in this liquid solution with the nutrients, the dissolved nutrients. But if you want to get roots to grow down in the ground, they apparently do respond to gravity. Right. Thank you. Uh, if there are no other questions, let's thank Dr. Sumner one more time. And the uh, last, uh, sorry. And the last speaker in this session is uh, Ian Raiho, head of da data science at FUNGA. Uh, Dr. Raiho is a quantitative ecologist with a background in using all kinds of ecological data to answer complex questions and make decisions, and is working on scaling fungus analysis pipelines and keeping fungi fun. Let's welcome her. Hi, thank you for having me today. Um, I'm here to talk about payload enhancement of the Mars mission, specifically focusing on a crucial but often overlooked partnership between plants and fungi. So on Earth, forests provide us many ecosystem services, um, such as soil organic matter recycling, um, oxygen production, um, and even bioremediation of toxins. And if ecosystem services sounded like jargon to you, everyone could just take a deep breath and think about how the oxygen every day is produced by a plant that lives here on Earth. Um, and fungi is particularly interested in the ecosystem service of carbon sequestration, so drawing down carbon from the atmosphere and storing it in the tissue of the plant in its biomass. And we focus specifically on enhancing that sequestration by improving the soil microbiome that's connected to the roots of these plants. And so what exactly am I talking about? This is a picture of a young pine tree, or a video, of a young pine tree's roots. And at the tips are mycorrhizal fungi forming in these Y shapes. This is where the plant starts to be, stop becoming a plant and starts becoming a fungus. And then you can also see these diffuse spiderweb looking uh, things in the background that are the fungal hyphae, or roots for the fungi, and roots for the fungi, not for the plant. And so what's going on here? The fungi and the plant are actually trading. Soil nutrients and water comes up from the fungi into the tree, and the tree gives back carbon resources to promote growth in the fungi. And so this symbiotic relationship is integral to trees growing bigger and storing more carbon in their biomass. So this is a question we ask ourselves a lot at Funga. Which microbes do we need to grow plants on Earth? Specifically, which soil microbes do we need to supply to trees so that they'll grow bigger and sequester more carbon. And there's been a lot of experiments done to answer this kind of question, and they're called big tree, little tree experiments. So on the right here, you can see a seedling that was inoculated with mycorrhizal fungi, and on the left is a tree that wasn't and provided as a control for comparison. So obviously the one on the right is much bigger and more lush, um, and the one on the left is much smaller. And so this ecosystem service of enhanced sequestration is what fungi is going for. Um, you can also in, increase pathogen resistance and drought tolerance when you do these types of inoculate, or when they've done these types of experiments in the nursery. Um, but how do we know where to get the soil? A lot of times we're looking for healthy forests, and a lot of times healthy forests are more old growth, or they've been there for a long time, 
And so they've been able to recruit lots of different kinds of species. They have high soil biodiversity living in the soil. So this kind of forest could provide us um, carbon sequestration benefits, but also habitat, ecosystem services, or like I said, soil organic matter recycling. However, when fungus at work in the forest, we are planting our seedlings in places like this. Um, and this is what our team likes to call the full nuke. <laughs> um, we, this was a clear cut pine forest in southern Georgia. And after they clear cut the trees, they actually burn the remaining vegetation and then fly over it in a helicopter with herbicide. And then they also till the bedded rows um, so that it becomes like a really clean slate for planting trees the next year. Not unlike, maybe, a Martian landscape, harsh conditions and low nutrients in the soil. Um, we know that these practices greatly reduce soil fungal biodiversity. And so we're scaling our process of bringing um, enhanced soil microbiomes in the Loblolly Pine Market in, so in the southeast US. Um, and we picked the Loblolly Pine Market because it's the largest in North America and because pines are known to have a close relationship with mycorrhizal fungi. And there's a lot of data in this area, so it's a big data opportunity for us to uh, leverage for our selection. And so, like the introduction said, I'm the head data scientist. I'm not a mycologist. Um, so this is really where my work lies in the data, data process. Um, and we use a process called ecological forecasting which myself and our CEO and founder, Colin, learned by Dr. Michael Dietz, who's here at BU. Um, and basically, it works like this. First, we collect, this is the Loblolly Pine footprint in pink. And first, we collect data across the whole southeast. And so these are about 400 paired locations where a person went out and collected a handful of soil, and that was dried at home and then sent to a sequencing lab where they extract the DNA of the fungal species that are living inside the soil. And this has ended up to be actually about 62,000 unique species that were identified across the southeast US. Um, and while they're there, after they're done collecting the soil, they also walk around to each tree and measure its diameter and get an estimate of its height. And so in that way, we know how much carbon is in the tree and what species are living in its roots to help the tree grow to its full potential. And then we're able to model this relationship. And that's where machine learning comes in, our different modeling techniques. We use an ensemble of machine learning algorithms to connect the soil community and environmental covariates with above ground biomass. And then we perform a simulated experiment where we swap the soil all around and predict biomass again across the different sites that are potentially planting sites and then we can optimize for the soil that we eventually select and go and get with our dump truck. Um, and so about 30 of these soils were collected in this way and sent to our nursery in um, Austin, Texas. And they did this big tree, little tree experiment, right, where they grew some that were inoculated and some that were uninoculated as control for about eight weeks. Um, and these lighter green circles are supposed to represent kind of like winds, and the darker greens are kind of where we didn't see a difference between control and inoculated. Um, yeah, so once they're in the greenhouse and we're able to determine which of these 30 soils best established on the roots and then performed a higher ecosystem service, a better growth in the seedling, we could deploy them in the field. And so we actually have about 14 field sites spread across this same region. Um, they're two acre trials and they're cut into 16 blocks and there's four treatments, including a control. And three of the treatments come from this set of 30. And so, you know, they didn't, they all, we got great results our first year. We had 30 to 60% more biomass in the inoculated trees versus the control. Um, but not, not all of them are winners, of course. And so next year, we'll get a bigger set of donor pools from our model selection and be able to kind of optimize and hone in on which places are better and for specific types of inoculations. Um, and more. <laughs> and more. Um, and so none of this could be done without really strong business relationships. And that's where um, 
the seedling partner, IFCO PRT, comes in, and this is one of their nurseries in Moultrie, Georgia. Um, and here, you know, you're not looking at just a thousand seedlings, you're looking at over a million. Um, and we went there last year and we were able to inoculate over a million seedlings and deploy them in the field. And this gives us a lot of statistical power to, you know, make decisions about which of these 62,000 microbes to pick to put in or to have in the donor soil. Um, and also, you know, thanks to the Funga team, we're a team of 12. We have six PhDs on the team, and they work on things like the bioinformatics pipeline, the ecological modeling, and also the experimental design of the field trials and the greenhouse trials. Um, but back to like the real question, which microbes would you need to grow on Mars? Um, Judith was talking a lot about, you know, emotional support of plants and how that was important. And I know, you know, when my house plants die, I don't feel particularly happy. And so I would think that, you know, they would need to select for survival in the microbes that they bring to Mars um, if they were planning on doing that. And to do that, I think they would do a similar study to fungus, but using simula simulated Martian soil. Um, and they would need a lot of high power and tr to try a lot of different types of soil. And to do this iterative process where they're kind of weeding out the bad ones and selecting for the better soils over time. So I thank you so much for having me. I think this has given me a great opportunity, you know, to think about what fungus does, not as restoration to an old growth site, but maybe to restoration for enhanced ecosystem service. And I appreciate that. Could you elaborate a little bit on the kind of modeling you're using and the kind of data you're looking at? Sure. Um, so it all starts with the soil data collection. Um, and we collect soil all in loblolly pine plantations. And then that soil is sequenced for fungal DNA and put through a bioinformatic pipeline to get out, out an abundance table. And this abundance table, you know, is 400 sites by 62,000 species and it's counts of each species. Um, and that can be turned into like a community metric, a PCOA or something. And so we feed those PCAs directly into the models with um, environmental covariates for the locations where they were collected. And so in that way, the environment and the soil are paired to what's growing above ground. And we can disentangle the effects of, say, precipitation from the effects of the community living below ground. What is the uh, impact on the environment? So can you monitor straight away? Oh, what was the last part of that? Uh, can you monitor straight away what's the production increase in oxygen? Yeah, so if you, I should have put here, but we have our own big tree, little tree experiments that we have pictures of now. And so if you go on Fungus LinkedIn, there's a picture of one of the employees standing next to a tree, and the control is much smaller than the inoculated. And we see about six, 30 to 60 percent more wood volume in our inoculated field trials than the control. Thank you. <laughs> and I guess I should say that's about um, a thousand at the highest level. In 25 years, which is the rotation of the plantation, it's about a thousand tons CO2e per acre removed from the atmosphere. Um, people ask this question um, who are trying to sell the timber on the plantations, and they have similar experiments where they put a lot of fertilizer on at the beginning, and they haven't seen any wood density effects due to um, increased growth, like accelerated growth. 
So I don't, we wouldn't expect, we would just be expecting to do, deliver the same kind of wood density as those. Those were really great talks. Let's thank all the speakers one more time. And uh, we'll get back here at 4.30.